And um, just um, also, no flash photography is permitted, but we do encourage you very strongly to um, uh, tweet um, about the sessions using the hashtag uh, ZJLF2019. Uh, and um, let's see, um, this is a safe zone that we try to create here at ZJLF, and so and no harassment of any kind will be uh, will be permitted. And so. Um, Please, if you see anything, and if you see any harassment, please do report it to um, anyone from the team. Um, we have a really exciting session here next at um, uh, Samwad, uh, one that I'm really looking forward to as a recent transplant to New York myself. Um, please um, welcome to the stage for this session the new, the new New York no novel, No Violet Bulawayo, Tanya James, and Tanvi Nandini Islam in conversation with Hari Kunzru. Hello, everybody. Welcome, my name's Hari Kunzru, and uh, I'm joined here today by three exceptional novelists, um, all of whom, I think it's safe to say, have a connection at least to New York State. The New York, the new, new York novel may be a slightly misleading uh, title for this, but um, all of us uh, have passed through the city of New York as, as, uh, as, as writers and residents and uh, um, and it is part of our imaginations. I will, so nearest to me is uh, Tanya James. Who is the author of the novel Atlas of Unknowns, which we will be discussing today. The short story collection, Aerograms, and another novel, The Tusk That Did the Damage. You know, our, um, she's, well, she has, a, she has a long and very distinguished bio, but one thing we need to know, it's very important to, to know, is that she's actually wearing Tanvi's lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amitabha. Um, in the middle we have Novaila no Bolaweo, who, um, <laughs> yes. A lot of love in the room for Novaila, um, who's the author of We Need New Names, which um, was, I think, one of the most widely uh, acclaimed novels of, of 2013. Um, until uh, recently she was teaching at Stanford, but is now uh, living for a while in Cape Town in, in South Africa. Um, and at the end, lipstick maker and novelist, multi multi talented Tanvi Nandini Islam, uh, who is the author of uh, Bright Lines, which was, uh, I mean, everybody has so many prizes, it's quite extraordinary. Um, but she is also the creator of High Wildflower, which is uh, an independent fragrance and, and beauty house. Um, she's working on a second novel called Stella Smoke and uh, an extraordinary sounding project called Mala, which is a podcast and a perfume anthology featuring the scents and stories of formerly incarcerated women. Um, everybody on stage has uh, a connection to New York City of some kind or another. And all of us, I think, have connect have like many New Yorkers and non-New Yorkers come from, uh, from elsewhere. So I'll start by asking you, Tanya, what is your relationship to the city and what, is, and, and what happens to the characters in Atlas of Unknowns to bring them to, to New York? Okay, um, well, I, um, let's see, I came to New York as a student. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky is a state in the sort of middle south of America. Um, I came to New York for uh, my MFA, a graduate degree in writing. Um, but I think I, I chose New York because it wasn't, it was, um, well, you know, I'm from in Kentucky and it was a very small Indian community there. And I, I felt like I understood how people saw me there. I, I felt like there, were, there was a certain type of person I was, I was being, but I wanted to be in a place where I could sort of disappear and by disappearing try on other sorts of selves and to me New York City seemed the type of place where 
um, it was conducive to that because it's it's a city of so many cells and, and it's so many cities within the city and so I felt like I could disappear at a time when I really wanted to disappear uh, because of of the anonymity that it offers and you know I think I was you know I was in my twenties and so at that you time you do not want to be under the eye of the aunties <laughs> <laughs> yes that's exactly what's called a burning eye um, yeah there's no one in New York to tell you you look stupid which aunties are very good at telling you uh, that you sound stupid and um, and because you know nobody in New York knew the before me or the, the person I was supposed to be there was just it was just um, it was just that at that time that's the, what I wanted um, and now I want different things I mean that's a very common story isn't it the ability to reinvent yourself in a, in a city no I mean Violet we should we should deal with the elephant in the room which is that it, um, we need new names. They don't, in fact, migrate to New York. They go to Detroit, don't they, in the suburbs of, uh, of Detroit and places in there in Michigan. But, when they, but the place they come from has a strange cosmopolitan, po cosmopolitanism to it. In the names that you've given the uh, districts of your um, Harari slum in your uh, novel, I think, it's, uh, and the other districts of Harari, I think it's like Budapest and Paradise. And there's a kind of imaginary world that they come from uh, that your central character, darling, comes from and then, and then makes this extraordinary journey into being an American. We see her go through stages and stages and stages as she gradually becomes an American. Um, what, you know, what, if anything, does that relate to your own story in any, in any direct way? Uh, thank you all for, for coming through. This is my first time here, my first time in India, and I'm already planning of uh, planning to come back. So, awesome. yeah. So I, I have a missed connection with New York City. Um, I had an opportunity to study there when I was considering MFA programs, and I was actually accepted at uh, NYU. Uh, but I chose Cornell over. Uh, NYU, partly because New York City just sounded too much for me. Um, and do you like the cold? <laughs> well, the co I was coming from Michigan. I call Kalamazoo, Michigan, my home away from home. Uh, and coming from, a, from small spaces, really, uh, New York City kind of overwhelmed me. Um, but at the same time, it's a place where I'd escape to on weekends, to party in Harlem, for instance, uh, eat all this amazing food from all over the place that I wasn't necessarily getting uh, in Ithaca, New York, where I was based. So in as much as I was not actively creating from there, I was creating from uh, four and a half hours away. Ithaca is f about four and a half hours away from New York City. But I, I could feel the ghosts of the, the city, uh, especially the, the immigrant story, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a place where everybody's pretty much from, from somewhere. And the fact that my book was kind of dealing with, 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 with that narrative was sort of, uh, you know, I felt like the city somewhere in the background was kind of affirming, you know, and also amplifying the story that I was trying to tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Tanvi, again, a different story and a different relation to the city. Um, and you've written a, a, a novel that's set in a neighborhood of Brooklyn. It's very dear to my heart. In fact, bizarrely, I live on the next block from where, the, where this novel is, is set. But you uh, are writing about a period, it, it seems like it could be 100 years before I came, but the, the, this is a neighborhood that is changing so rapidly called Clinton Hill in Brooklyn, and, and the, the version that you've memorialized in your novel has already gone into history. So maybe could you, could you say a little bit about how, I mean, you're a New Yorker, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and that feeling of the city that just, just, you know, gets rid of its past so quickly and easily. So I wanted to capture how New York changes from block to block and you go from one block to another block and it's different communities, people that have been there for generations versus people that are immigrants coexisting. Um, and my connection to New York is 
really deep because I always knew I wanted to live there and I had grown up in the South, the Midwest, but New York was where I wanted to end up. And when I got to Brooklyn, it felt like this idyllic kind of multicultural lens with which to see the city. Um, but that now it feels like a love letter. My novel feels like a love letter to that New York. It's, it's like a time capsule of that New York. And I think there's a sadness that I feel when I think of that time because now we're dealing with a lot of development and gentrification and people no longer being able to afford living in the city. So I wanted to talk about what it means like for a Bangladeshi family to put down roots to build a home that is theirs in New York which 750,000 Bangladeshi people have done in New York City, you know? So I feel very much like the city speaks to uh, my people's migration to the city, and I wanted to kind of capture that relationship that they have to a black American neighborhood in, in New York and what that, you know, interplay is like. I mean, the, the physically building is, is part of, the, of, of, of what happens in the book. And, and, and I, obviously, as I, I live in the neighborhood. There are a lot of places that are, are still the same that I recognize, you know, even the names of stores and cafes. But I think, actually, there's a, there's a local business. I think he's Bangladeshi, the guy who does most of the renovations of the brownstones yes. in the neighborhood. He does all their front. Yes. And he is... A, a well-known figure in this in this neighborhood because he is the person who takes the mm -hmm. takes the houses from a state of dilapidation into the kind of beautiful, desirable, um, gentrified residences, or well, the residences of the gentry. Um, so when when you were there, because I I know you've defected to Williamsburg, you um, <laughs> which is a whole other thing. Um, when you when you were there. Um, were there a lot of Bangladeshi people? Or was, I mean, I, the, the, the local mosque and the pharmacy and everything, they seem to be mostly Egyptians. No, I think that the thing that I realize is that you'll see on the street like a truck that's actually repairing the brownstones and it'll be like Alam Construction. And you'll know that that's a Bangladeshi-owned construction company. So it's almost like the people behind these constructed homes who are making the homes, and I wanted to reimagine in maybe a fictionalized sense what it would be like if you could buy a brownstone for a dollar and create this haven of your own, which ultimately will be destroyed in the book if you buy the book. But I just feel like that to me was important to show what it would be like to see the people that are fixing up these brownstones if they actually lived inside of it. And I think like that's what I wanted the story to do, is like going inside of one of these homes. That's just such an iconic part of the New York, you know, story. I mean, Tanya, you're, the New York in your novel is um, is very stratified New York. You're also extremely aware of, of things like gentrification and the kind of class differences of the city. But you have a young girl from South India sort of cheating her way into uh, a very famous private school. I think that's a real school, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't know. close to the is name it, of a real school. <laughs> it is close <laughs> is to the name of a real school. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, had this experience of... Um, I tutored very wealthy kids in New York City for a brief time. And so I had access in some way to this very, very upper class segment of New York. And then I would go to Jackson Heights once in a while, Jackson Heights in Queens... Um, you should probably say a little. I mean, I'm sure many people yeah. do know Jackson Heights, but let's let's yes, say what that specify. means for South Asians in in New York. It, it's actually only about four blocks by 25 blocks, but um, it is probably more than half Latino. But a huge South Asian population is there, um, and um, at the time, this is in 2003. At the time, it was mostly uh, Gujarati, Punjabi, and maybe also Bangladeshi people there. Now there's more Nepali and. Um, Pakistanis, but um, at the time I would go in, go there, and I would feel this weird sense of nostalgia, but also dislocation because there were all these brown faces and um, the the grandmothers in the sweaters and the vegetables I only would ever see in my mother's garden. But then also people were speaking languages that I didn't understand, and so I thought that would be interesting to kind of move the character from one very privileged place to another place where she's kind of gone into hiding. Um, and that, that, that second place, Jackson Heights, would provoke a kind of nostalgia, but also longing, because the thing 
that it's 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 never going to be the home she wants it to be. It just is a, a totally other place in and of itself. Um, but I had access to these places. I wasn't of those places, um, and it was just enough access to feel interesting to me and and to you know productive in terms of where I could set the story. I mean, Navila, is there a is there a place where a particular part of New York where Africans would go to meet other Africans and, and uh, find community? Um, I'd, I'd say m my friends were mostly in Harlem and, and Brooklyn. And of course, the, the shape of, of the city itself is, is changing and people are scattered all over uh, based on income, for instance. So I, I, was, I followed the party wherever it was. But I'd say Harlem for me is, is a place that is dear because that's where a, a lot of the African population is concentrated. You know, I'd remember I'd go to African, the African market on 116 and just the, 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 the delight of, of seeing brothers and, and sisters from all over the continent selling their wares in this, in this new, sp new space. Words that reminded me of home, that took me of home, uh, is, is always special. I always go back, even today when I'm in New York City, um, I make it a point to go to the market, yeah. But do you also derive energy from the uh, extraordinary black cultural history of yeah, that neighborhood absolutely. as well? Other, yeah, and other cultures as well. You know, other cultures that know something about belonging and not belonging. Um, and especially in this time where uh, being American is so, is so complicated and contested. Yeah, I, I, I think there's something affirming with being with other people who have a story that kind of mirrors and speaks to your own. Yeah. I, mean, do you, I mean, if you're asked the terrible where are you from question, I mean, you've already said you have a home away from home. I mean, how do you, how do you identify these days? These days it's complicated because I'm also dealing with a homeland that is breaking my heart every day. I, I spent the last six months uh, in Zimbabwe, in a Zimbabwe after the fall of our dictator, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. And being hopeful there, as most Zimbabweans, crossing our fingers for a future that unfortunately is refusing to be born uh, just last week, we had the first ever violent protest, at least in my lifetime, um, that was sparked by a 150% increase in fuel in a space where fuel was already scarce. Um, I remember the first time I stood in, I, I, I was in a queue for three hours for fuel, but people were spending the night in lines waiting for fuel. Anyway, the government retaliated by killing 78 people um, and about 400, uh, upwards of 400 people are in prison right now, including minors. So that certainly does complicate your relationship with home, especially since I've spent the last two decades living away from home. But then at the same time, my other home is equally messed up. You know, America is messed up right now. So there is a, a feeling of, you know, there is a, what do you call, um, an attraction to rejecting both spaces and calling myself homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd say that by virtue of me being born in a specific space, Zimbabwe, my family is still there, my heart is still there. Uh, Ndevele is my first language, it's how I dream, it's how I imagine, and so on. I, I'd say Zimbabwe, even as it's a complicated relationship, is still home. Uh, but I'm also learning to find home wherever my feet are, you know, which took me quite a while, but I'm realizing that it's, it's, it's practical, mm -hmm. especially given these heartbreaks that are coming from my complicated countries. I mean, what is it like being a, a Zimbabwean writer, a visible figure? I mean, are you, uh, do you have, uh, uh, I, I imagine you're asked to comment on political matters and, uh, and maybe if you have family there, that's not always a straightforward thing. I mean, is it, is it easy for Zimbabwean writers abroad to speak their minds? It is easy, and I think a big part of it is that 
people in Zimbabwe right now are speaking their minds on, on, on Twitter, ETC. And so, you know, you, you see yourself as part of a village whose responsibility is to interrogate Zimbabwe and Zimbabweans, uh, whose responsibility is to call out our governments. So it's, 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 uh, it's a good feeling that I'm, a, I'm at least able to lend my voice uh, to be a participant in that specific story. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell me, are you ever called upon to speak on Bangladeshi issues? Um, not as much as other writers are probably, <laughs> but <laughs> for whatever reason. But I have a lot of feelings about home too. Um, a friend of a friend was murdered, who's a gay Bangladeshi writer in his home, who's butchered to death um, by fundamentalists. So I think a lot about what it means to write about gender and sexuality, what it write, means to write about religion in that context. And I feel very passionate about writing about those things. And the more I grow as a writer, the more I'm tackling those things head on through fiction. Uh, so. I feel called upon to write about it, mm -hmm. but am I being asked what I think as a Bangladeshi woman, American writer? I don't know that what I think I mean, as a, as a young woman, um, I mean, I've, I've certainly noticed that there is, a, there is a sort of policing of the voices of young women in many, in many cultures. And uh, for, I, for example, I, re I remember when uh, Monica Ali wrote Brick Lane about, uh, about Bangladeshi Siletis in, in uh, London, there was a lot of um, uh, sort of public grumping about uh, about why you know who is who is she to speak you know why 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 should she be putting herself forward like this is that uh, do you ever get pushback of that kind? Um, I get a very variegated pushback. So I, I would say from the aunties, my mother who is very active is um, in the blogger world. It's a very active online space. And, you know, these are women that love what I'm doing, that read any article I write, who want to talk about feminism and gender and sexuality, because it's very, very, it's a very feminist society. You know, they run their households, they are doing things that are breaking the mold, and they feel it. Any of the negative pushback I've had has been more uncles who are not feeling what I'm saying, who have taken time to write me about the things that I'm doing that are offensive to them. And that's just a generalization, obviously. I'm just breaking it into kind of gendered terms. So I do think that part of our work as writers is finding our readers, but not being too consumed with who they are. I just want my work to resonate I want my work to resonate with the people that I'm writing about too, but in some ways I think you know, that they, they hear me and they see me and they let me know that. And a lot of it is because they are feeling that those unspoken stories are coming to life in some way. You know? Can I, Tanya, a similar question for, for you. I mean, you said that you went to New York to escape and to reinvent yourself. And, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, that that involves escaping from something. So, what, I mean, do you uh, ever also feel that there are people who are policing what you would like to say, and uh, and how do you deal with that, if so? Um, no, I think, th well, the, the policing usually comes after a book comes out, and there is some pushback about details I've gotten wrong or the way someone is speaking. Um, I'm talking about novels or stories that I've set in um, India. And um, I used to have a much thinner skin about that. And now I feel like that policing is, that sort of policing, which is different from your, the one you're talking about, which is probably more a reaction to moral correctness or something. Um, but the policing that has to do with, well, if, are you getting it right, I think is healthy and it is good. And um, I, I accept that I will get things wrong. And a lot of times with my students, they're so nervous about getting things wrong. Like when you're writing about somebody else, um, you know, getting, getting all the details wrong. Um, and I, I try to tell them that the truth has to come from a different place. The truth has to come from, the, the, the very more important truth is a kind, of, um, a kind of attention and curiosity about your character 
for me, when, now when I hear you, you got this wrong, I accept that. And, and part of my project is to, to, um, to kind of accept my fallibility and my vulnerability as a writer, that I am going to get things wrong, whether I am Malayali or not. I mean, I, I've written about Malayalis um, in different parts of Kerala that I, that I'm from Vainad, I don't know anything about Vainad. You know, I'm not from there. So I get things wrong and I do get policed, but that sort of policing I feel like is, is, is good. I deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is quite a strange time to be, um, I think certainly to be teaching writing. It's uh, because the, uh, the anxiety about the ownership of stories is something that I, I think is, is, is around a lot in the, in the writing world. And, um, and it is, a, you know, if the, if the legend of New York is a legend of, or, you know, the legend of coming into America maybe is the, is the legend of reinvention and of, uh, of being able to take material that's around you and forge it into a self for yourself. That's in tension with another uh, um, kind of st narrative at the moment, which is all to do with uh, the idea that only people who own stories, whatever that means, should be, uh, should be able to, to, to tell them. Um, um, Navila, you were saying that you're actually not teaching anymore and you, you smiled as if that was, a, that was a, a, a small burden lifted from your shoulders. But have you, I mean, how, how do you tell students who want to write about something that perhaps they don't, uh, it's a story that's far away from them, that it's against that old writing adage of write what you know? Um, it's, a, it's a tricky line to walk because on one hand you really certainly don't want to police what people uh, write about just as I don't want anybody telling me what I can write and what I cannot write. But then there are sensitive stories I think that uh, call for somebody to at least approach them from a space of responsibility, from a space of respecting the issues, from a space of being aware, um, especially if you are writing about living people, you know. Um, being simply aware of their politics, educating yourself on, on what uh, certain people's experiences are like, what they care for. And most importantly, I think having conversations with those people, because sometimes you have somebody telling somebody's story and they haven't bothered to take the time to even talk to the people that they claim to be writing for. Um, and of course, today, everybody's on the internet expressing their opinions. And I rightly support people who, you know, who will come at writers or artists who are not telling their stories, I think in a way that honors who they are and their, and their you know, and people's journeys and experiences. Mm -hmm. Same question for you, Tanvi. How do you negotiate that when you're talking to maybe younger people about telling stories and what their responsibilities are? I hate the word responsibility in general. <laughs> it's not, I'm not into responsibility. Um, I feel very called to storytelling because I feel like my project is liberation and liberation to just be in your most free, like, human self. Like, that's what I want young people to, to feel. Like, their writing space is a liberatory space for them. Um, so for me, responsibility to an identity or an authenticity, I don't know what that means. I, even, like, writing Bright Lines, I felt almost attacked by the borders in my brain because I grew up with all these Malayali people. There's no Malayali people in Bright Lines, which is crazy. People thought I was Malayali, like my whole existence. But it's not in my book because I felt called to write about Bengali people. You know what I mean? So I think we're not... Did you, did you feel obligated to write about Bengali people? Yes, totally. And then I was like, oh, I should set it in Queens. But I'm like, but I'm a Brooklyn person. But, but Queens felt more Bangla. Like, I do feel the pressure of that lip responsibility, but I, did, I reject it, you know? Like, I feel like the new work that I'm working on is dealing with technology and trauma and, f like, just relationships between women, the erasure of women's knowledge. I mean, these are things that I feel so deeply that being Bangladeshi is like part of that narrative, but it's just the lens that I inherited to look at the world through, and it's also a very new lens. I mean, my grandparents and their parents lived in different versions of the land that my people are on. I, 
I just think we need to keep changing. I mean, that's what you're talking about too. It's like your land is changing rapidly. We're all dealing with that. So I don't know if I feel like I can ever grasp the vastness of it, but I think that I can tell young writers that create a liberatory space of your imagination to like flourish here and hopefully you do some good for your people in the process. But I think the pressure is mobile, it, like immobilizing, honestly. Uh, I'm always I was fascinated with the way that the, the idea of authenticity is bandied around and especially used to, to, I mean, the very idea that you would have felt that the authentic thing for you to do would be to write about Queens rather than where you are actually, is, is, is such a sort of, I, 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 I under, it's 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 a very very particular kind of pressure. There's a sort of there's a sort of nebulous presence on your shoulder saying that you know you're deviating from some sort of perfect norm. Um, and migration tends to make us feel inauthentic. I mean, let alone I mean, you know, I sometimes say I'm the most inauthentic person I know. Um, not brown enough, not white enough, not English enough, not certainly not American enough. Um, and I mean, is is that something that preys on you at all, or are you are you happily inauthentic? Well, I I have ex I, I'm happily apathetic about it now, <laughs> <laughs> which I wasn't before. But um, I I what you were saying, Thumbi, about um, expectations. I think one of the things I'm drawn to, and I feel more free to do now, is to play with genre and not feel. And it seems like that's what you're doing now. At that. Um, that I could write a story that um, sounds that bears more in common with Barthelme than Lahiri, and that's fine. That that is, I feel yeah, free uh, with um, Barthelme, you know, like you know that Bartholme, kind of yeah. you know, craziness, surrealism, um, and and it's still me. It's still me talking, and and that you know I don't have to. When I was submitting my book for for an a for agents, you know, I kept hearing the same thing, which was you know. This would be a little better if it were more like Lahiri, you know, if it were more realistic, if it was more this, and um, and you know that that sort of builds all this expectation within your head of what you're supposed to sound like. And now I feel like, well, I feel like a lot of people, you two, are playing with genre, with with ghost stories, and you know, I don't know for you if that was some some kind. Did that feel like you were breaking away from something? You were breaking away as a writer in a different way. Did you feel like? Absolutely. I mean, I th I. Th I mean, I started publishing back in, uh, in, in 2000 was when I got a, a, a first book contract. And at the time, um, the gatekeepers of publishing were, were white people in London and, and New York. And their notion of things that brown people should write was very particular. And it was formed by things that had been huge successes like Midnight's Children. There were, you know, there were a few models for how to be a... a, a a, a brown writer, and um, and my first novel, in a way, was a sort of stealth thing, in that I did write something which was set. It had a lot of Indian history, and in it. it had a lot of. Uh, it was all about the the Raj and colonialism, and uh, and I think that was very. It was that was something that was quite understandable at that time, and then. I started to feel the walls closing in because that was one, I mean, I, I was interested in finding my place in that history and it was a literary project that was important to me, but it was one literary project. And I loved Donald Bartholme and, and postmodern experimentation. And, and, and it I watched as a, a whole generation of young writers were encouraged to commodify their ethnic specificity for consumption by, uh, an international public, and to do so in a very realist mode. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, the, uh, it, you know, to talk about migration, to talk about the, the smells of the kitchen, uh, to talk about uh, family. Mm -hmm. And all of these things are very much in opposition to another kind of way of being a writer that might be to be an experimental writer or an avant-garde writer. It kind of closed us off from being a certain sort of, uh, uh, highly uh, regarded, aesthetically regarded writer. And so I became more and more suspicious of anything like that. And, uh, and then, you know, to the, I mean, when I, I did eventually write a book with no Indian characters in it, it was very interesting to see who paid attention and who didn't and how difficult that was for people 
to find uh, a book like that with, a, with my name on the cover and then the contents had nothing to do with my ethnic background. I mean, Novaya, people, I mean, the people here are very, very familiar with a, a, a large and quite kind of commercially successful genre of Indian, Indian origin, South Asian origin writing that is, uh, uh, I mean, Jim Blahiri is a, is a sort of template for a lot of, uh, a lot of writers in a certain sort of family and migrant novel. Are there, um, are there things that you have to fight against in order to be free as an African writer? Who are you battling against as a, as a, a, a the, the anxiety of influence? Who's making you anxious? Um, I don't have time for anybody to make me anxious. <laughs> uh, and I, I think part of it is that I, I, I got into writing from a space of not exactly knowing what was going on in the industry. And I think that kind of uh, freed me to tell my story, to tell, uh, to tell the story that I wanted to tell um, and tell it on my own terms. And I became aware of the politics after I was done with my novel um, and was kind of slowly entering into the, you know, um, into the world of, of, of writing and expectations and so on after the fact. But now I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, things are changing and a big part of that is that there is a shift from who is publishing young African writers. We don't always have to look to the West uh, because people on the ground are starting to either self-publish uh, or publish, you know, voices. Uh, we're having the publication of local voices by local publishers. So I think that changes the game in terms of taking the pressure from the kind of stories that people expect um, from Africa. Can and you say, say the names of some of these publishers and where they're coming from? I mean, I'm aware of independent, uh, independent press in Nigeria called Cassava, I for think example. Cassava is certainly uh, at the forefront of that revolution. And they've just opened uh, offices in London and they are looking at uh, New York. But elsewhere on the continent, I feel like there are local publishers who are actually doing the work of amplifying uh, local talent. And the internet is also kind of making African writing and African writers be, you know, connected. We have active uh, festivals like Abantu in Cape Town, for instance, Writivism in Kampala, Uganda, uh, and Ake Festival in Nigeria. So. The infrastructure, people are investing in the infrastructure. That is hopefully going to move us away from an unhealthy system that tries to govern the kind of stories that come out from the continent. And that is especially important because we are coming from a space where the African story for so long was told by outsiders who had no, no love whatsoever for the continent but we'll still loot our stories um, and uh, tell them, not for us, but for themselves. So I, I think there's an important shift happening. Do you think young, so young African writers, do you have to leave for America still, or can you be an African writer and stay, uh, in, or at least in some African countries, so there's an infrastructure available to support you? I think more and more writers are producing work without ever leaving the continent. And I think that's an important statement. Uh, if you can do that, I think it's an important uh, development. And I would love to see that continue. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've had this experience. I remember I used to come to India and, and the, book, the bookstores would have Linda Goodman's Sun Signs, Mein Kampf, and uh, and Midnight's Children and uh, you know Ruskin Bond, and and now you go into a, a bookstore and there's an incredible wealth of of writing here, genre writing, history writing, political books. Um, I mean, India is is writing for itself in a way that uh, uh, that it uh, you know I felt that it, it wasn't able to do because of financial and economic constraints. You know, a generation ago. Um, Similar question to you, I mean, do you, do you feel that that journey to make it as a writer by going to the US or to, the, to London, is that still a necessary one for, for people who want to be recognized 
I, I, I don't. I think, um, well, the idea in my head was that you had to go to New York to be a writer. That's the idea I had. And um, just, I, I think that just as um, publishing is becoming decentralized, I mean, there's all these kind of dominant ideas we have. When, we were, when I was a grad student, the, the kind of most important thing was universalism. Like, you know, that somehow a story that, I, that someone writes in America should appeal to the whole world um, and I, the, the more I kind of have, my, my reading tastes have kind of grown, the more I realize that that's just not as important as it used to be. And I'm realizing that a book that appeals to someone in this audience shouldn't have to appeal to somebody in America. That, that these markets are growing up around the idea that we don't all have to like, you know, all, all, you know one nation, one city shouldn't have to dictate to everybody else. It's a kind of weirdly colonial um, idea of that, uh, that it seemed to me that publishing, I mean, my first book was um, bought by in, uh, Simon & Schuster UK, but th they didn't know how to sell it in India. They, and, and, and so that was like a weird kind of, it seemed to be outdated, anachronistic thing. But um, I, I, I embrace that idea. I teach in, you know, Virginia, and students feel less and less like they have to go to New York the way I felt like I had to go to New York. I think that's a good thing. I, th I think we've got about 10 more minutes, so we should, we should open it up to the floor for questions. 20, oh, we've got 20, but you're with us for a while yet. So no, we've got, we've got to have a little bit more conversation. I mean, well, Tanvi, I mean, you're in New York and quite of, of New York. I mean, do you, do you, but you're actually working outside those sort of circuits of, of, of New York literature quite a lot. I mean, have you felt it necessary to kind of get away from the gatekeepers? Okay, so I did not identify as a writer until a f five years ago. Like, that was not... I was an organizer, and I worked with young people in New York City high schools. It was just like, I just had a different life, so I think I was not writing to write for white readers in the publishing world, which I think is what we kind of are, it's, you get really hip to that being the reality of publishing, um, which is changing, which you're talking about. So to me, I love being on the outside because I get to do what I want. And when I say outside, I just mean like, my New York is at the end of the train, you know, in the outer boroughs. Like that's where I was working in, parts of Brooklyn that most New Yorkers don't go to regularly, like Canarsie or Flatlands or the Bronx. So I just feel like the map that I have in my head about the worlds that I'm interested in are very outside of what publishing thinks about when they're thinking about what someone like me would write. Um, and I do want to say that just being South Asian but not Indian, like, it's a whole different world of, you know, like... Like, you have pressure to be like Salman Rushdie, maybe, but I feel like I have we pressure should say to be... That, we say that there is a, there's a sort of discussion group that we go to sometimes in, in <laughs> New York where it, uh, it sounds a, a, a Pan-Asian discussion group that often defaults to Indians or, or Indian diaspora people talking about being Indian. Yeah. And you have your hand up saying, yeah. I'm excuse like, Hello, me. What about us? Some... Like, I'm the what about us person. But I just, I, I think that, like, the... Struggle is like, oh, we know that story. We know that story. But it's like, no, you actually don't know the Sri Lankan story or the Bangladeshi story or the Nepali story or the, you know, uh, the Pakistani story. These are all parts of the narrative that we're building. And, you know, I think as we move away from partition in terms of historical time, like time passes, there is this, like, freedom that we have to start looking towards the future, writing in a way that is imagining what is possible. And like, I think about things like rivers and nature and plants and flowers, and that's very political too, you know? Like the rivers are all ending in Bangladesh, and the way that the rivers shift and the way that the rivers moved has very much influenced commerce, religion, history. So I always have to look to India in some origin sense but that's not my origin story. So it's always like negotiating these multiple origin stories at the same time. And 
I think we're all kind of in conversation with each other. I just think the conversation's getting bigger. So being outside of it allows us to kind of decenter the white gaze, decenter the Indocentric gaze, to make more space for these actual realities that are much more interesting than the narratives that people have told us work. You know, like. And I think uh, coming back to your least favorite word, uh, word responsibility. I think the industry uh, should also assume the responsibility of diversifying uh, its offices. For instance, I, I, I know that uh, it's dominated mostly, the gatekeeping is done mostly uh, by white Westerners. So what does it mean if a publishing industry, uh, if a publishing company has, as part of their acquisitions team, a group of people that reflects the diversity of the world. I think that is going to start to impact the kind of stories uh, that people look for and why they look for them. So it sh the, the, the burden shouldn't always rest on writers. We shouldn't be, you know, we should be worrying about other things, you know, versus trying to fix what the system should otherwise be dealing with. So how do we kind of bring the other side of the equation to the same table, you know, and share that collective burden of making uh, the production of books as, as, as clean and less violent and as open as possible. I think that's a great place for us to end our conversation and open it up, actually, to... Uh, do we have microphones? Is that how it's working? Will people have uh, mics to... Get around? So put your hands up if you do have a question for anyone on the panel. I'm seeing at least three three here, um, and somebody will, will come and uh, uh, you get to go to the, well, yes, the, the lady there, yeah. Hello, my question is, uh, I think you on a very serious note. The thing is that we started with the writing of novel where collective man was in focus. But now when we explore the recent writings, we find the focus is the individual man, the entity of being someone. So when we are surrounded by ills of very ugly nature, don't we feel that humanity as collective consciousness is the need of the day? So uh, who, who'd like to address the question of collective consciousness? Sorry, what was the last part of the question? See, dear, my question is that the focus of recent writing of the new generation is on how a person should evolve in sense of belongingness in sense of tracing one's root, in sense of realizing one's own resources, in terms of skills and in terms of ability. And then you have a lot of experimentation in the form of what to do with various genres. So the focus is on the structure. The focus is on telling, or I would say rather showing what the ills are around. But what about the ecology inside? Because this is something that the person wants. The, the fear of, um, say, drug addiction, the, for, the fear of uh, people, you know, being separated in their own cocoons, the loss of where do we belong to. So I believe, you know, the focus should be on the ecology. So are you people trying any best to show what the new novel would be if the focus is on the inside? Maybe in the yeah. decades to come. Thank you for your comment. Does anybody have, a, have anything um, on that? I, thank you for your question. Um, I feel that very deeply. I think that the ecology of the inside reflects the society. I think women very much know that. Like We hold so much of the emotional weight of family, friendship, connection. All these things that we're negotiating is also affected by the ills of society. So what I'm really f interested in, I think, with my writing now is to go inward to c find this mind, body, environment, politics, history, the synergy of all these different spheres of human existence and life as it is experienced in a very deeply uh, inward 
inward way, you know, to go inward, to, see, to show what happens to the person as they are reckoning with all these traumas of the society around them, you know? And my focus now is very much telling the story of women whose voices have been erased from history. So researching women who have been erased from history who have done very brilliant things, but we don't know their names. So I think putting names to things and uncovering those names in history that we don't even know allows me to explore that in the new form of the novels that we're all writing to give them names as a record of history, but also as a new way of telling the story of what it is to be in this body, in this time, for the future, to, to kind of show where we are living. So um, we have a gentleman right at the front for the next question. Sorry, carry sorry. on if you oh, have, no, if you have it's no, okay. No, that's, no. No. <laughs> yeah, that's all. all. <laughs> Just trying to keep it moving. Uh, so as, as writers, uh, do you ever face uh, this kind of inner conflict where on the one hand, you really want to tell the world the story of your people, right? Just what your people are, not even who. But on the other hand, you also feel very strongly about, uh, say, uh, telling the world your take as a woman, and maybe something else, and then something else. Do you ever feel this pressure, this inner conflict to make all of these things intersect? Um, I, I never feel a pressure to tell the story of, of people, when I have felt that pressure, like say if I come, I approach um, a story from the perspective of I'm telling a story about gentrification or I'm telling a story about migration, then the, the project always loses all its excitement for me. It's when I can access a certain, a very specific uh, perspective that, um, that things always sort of that, that kindles the story for me. So I don't know about you guys, if you have a different way. Um, I, I always free myself by remembering that I'm not, right, I'm not working alone and that I cannot tell each and every story and that there are writers telling other stories. We will meet somewhere on, you know, what, on, on some other random street and to to be content with telling the specific story that comes to me at a time and just focus on it and trust that all these other voices are doing the other tellings for me. Yeah, and I think as a writer, I find that serendipity, like finding the perfect historical moment, the perfect fact about a color or, for me, I'm a perfumer too, so I, I write about scent a lot. but. A perfume tells a story about the history of my people. Like, it doesn't have to be this war or battle that happened on my land. It can be this perfume that came from the actual land, made with materials from that land. And I think that's what I'm looking for, is how to tell the story in a way that is evolving our understanding of what we are. You know, we're not just these Indo Indian Bengali, like we're, we're so many things. I mean, to me that the whole thing is like multiplicity and infinity and the complexity of who we are, you know? So I, I think that I like the challenge of just writing and then whatever themes come up, will the world will tell us what it's about, you know, so. Yeah, and what I'm drawn to as a reader is not necessarily those surface things, but you're drawn to the consciousness of the person, right? That's, that's what you kind of lock into and um, the way someone is noticing things is, uh, is sort of, that's, that's how I'm trying to lure a reader in and lure myself in. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Um, there was a gentleman in the back there who had had his hand up before, right? Yeah. Uh, keep your hand up so that she can see where, where, you're, where you are. Um, and then I acknowledge you as well. Mm. Thank you. So how uh, are you carrying the, your research to make the uh, storytelling more grounded and not exotic enough, being far away and long away from the uh, nation of your origin? Thank you. So how you, are, you, making, you, how so you are making your research works uh, to make it more grounded, the story is more grounded, not exotic enough, since oh, you are away. Right. Can we? Oh, for me. <laughs> and who, no, Valeta. One thing is, uh, uh, as you are away uh, and uh, you had uh, been uh, not fishing the 
exact uh, situation in nation in back in Zimbabwe, was it possible to produce the same uh, very critical and strong uh, criticism against the uh, regime being in your home country as uh, Mohammed Hanifi back in Kathmandu last month I told that uh, writing in uh, against the regime in many cases uh, back in Pakistan is a very difficult situation. How is that in Zimbabwe's situation? Thank you. Well, Nawal has covered that a little bit in her answer. I mean, is it is it hard to 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 write politically against the regime in what he's calling our home countries? I mean, it's yeah. You've already said, Tanri, that you know you are not called upon necessarily so much to to do that. I mean, do you? Yeah. Does anybody have any kind of thoughts about how to write in an oppositional way on the safety or otherwise of that? I mean, if not, we I can... I do have... I you know, mean, I want to say yeah. that I want to... And I, I, there are two different... You asked two different questions, so I feel like you should answer if you, how you want to. I just w want to say that I... I write about things that I love and I'm obsessed with. So I, I... My exotic vibe or energy or origins, like, I don't even think about that, right? I'm obsessed with, like I said, plants, religious history, perfume cities, walking, what, you know, I'm obsessed with different things. So I think to see the mind, my mind, through these different obsessions in my work will tell you about my country of origin in a very different way than what is expected. I just feel like that's the thing that we've been, like, sure. Well, I think we've got, two, we've got two more minutes and a gentleman at the front is keen to get in. So maybe let's have his one, you can keep your hand up, sir, and... Uh, the mic will come to you, and you can be keep it brief, and we'll give you we'll give you pithy answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very 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 brief uh, questions. Uh, you know, I am not interested in the inner struggle of the writer, but I am more interested in the external struggle. How does he negotiate or she negotiate with the, with society? The kinds of pressures which society exerts on the writer. And uh, writing about uh, uh, the culture, New York culture, is so difficult because it's a mini world. So how, which part of New York will you write about? <laughs> uh, how c And the culture from which you originate, that lurks in your mind somewhere. It's lurking there. It's lingering. It has a lingering you know, effect. In a funny way, I think you've done my job of summarizing the whole uh, the whole session. Yeah, I mean, New York is it? Yeah, is an, a world in a city, and and it is impossible to encompass it in any way. So thank you for that, and um, I just like to to thank uh, Tanya James, Violet Boloyo, and Tamin Nandini Islam. Thank uh, you. Thank you all thank for coming. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, and also thank you to Avid Learning for sponsoring that session.